Bible. Today we're going to Destroying Christian Dogma Part 2. And man, I tell you, this is, this is like the heaviest series uh, I've done because I'm sitting at home trying not to drown everyone. But there's so, there's so many parts to Destroying Christian Dogma. It is, I'm just going to take our time. If it goes into Peyton year 2023, so be it. I don't want to drown you, and I want to present a, a, a case where you can you can have the witnesses so you can see. But this series, Destroying Christian Dogma, I'm, I'm using Destroying Christian Dogma, but everyone can benefit from it, even the Hebrews, even these Israelites. Again, I'm listening to an Israelite the other day, and he, he made a declaration, and to support his declaration, he read a scripture from the New Testament. And I'm like, wow, he really could have been benefited from our class because he thinks that scripture for the New Testament is actually authentic. Like he thinks that that that's the version of Paul's letter he's reading, and he doesn't know that it's went through editors, it's went through language changes. So this this series is not not to belittle the Christian church and not to attack these pastors. They're doing a great job of exposing themselves themselves. We don't really like Elder says. Like I went through my phase where I was already in fight mode. I'm gonna show him. No, we just pray that, you know, God has mercy on them and give them the light like he gave us because we can just show them scriptures and precepts to their blue in the face. If the Most High is not drawing them to his son, John 6 and 44, they're not going to get it. So this series is to help everybody, Hebrew, Israelites, Christians, Jews, Gentiles, strangers, anyone who wants to a better understanding of Abba Yah through the blood and under the blood and by the blood of his son, we're trying to help everyone. And if we get it wrong, we're not ashamed if you can help us say, oh, you got that wrong. If you're a man, you can always reach out to me. If you're a sister, you should go through your husband or go through your elder. You shouldn't reach out to me because I'm not going to respond to sisters. But this is for everyone. So this is not a, a thing about the Torah group trying to uh, rewrite the Bible or trying to destroy the Bible. We're trying to separate the most highest word from these books we call Bibles. That's what we're doing. So in part one, we sort of set the foundation that Christian dogma is, is rooted in these books. And these seminary schools, uh, I call it the, the Jesuit seminaries, they have these definitions and these declarations. The Bible is infallible, the Bible is inspired, and the Bible is inerrant. Those three eyes is the foundation of Christian dogma. And it's all based on these little books called Bibles. But when I get into my, my nosy mode, y'all know black people nosy. I'm like, well, the apostles didn't have Bibles. That none of them had Bibles. Paul would say, and when I come, bring those parchments, bring those other scrolls. So if this Bible is so authoritative, why don't our, our elders talk about Bibles? And then when I go a step further, we have a couple generations in here. We got a couple generations in here. The, the word for, I, I remember my grandfather, uh, now he just, I think he was born in the 20s sometime, but he ain't had this saying, you get too big for your britches, boy. <laughs> he talking about, what britches, what is britches? So in our society, words change. So, 
The apostles live, let's entertain these Romans because they made up a time system. How you have a time system that start, you skip zero and it's one AD. I go from one BC, first I'm gonna count down backwards from 3200 BC to one BC, then it's a, oh, can't have the year zero, so it's just one AD. How you, how you invent a system like that? So let's just entertain the Romans, the monks who made up this time system. The apostles and Messiah walked first century from, from zero or sorry, from one AD to 100 is the first century. So they lived in the 100s. And the fragments we're gonna bring out, the fragments you got for your New Testament, they really don't appear older than 300 AD. So do you think some words might have changed in 200 years? That Paul might not have used that word. But now you get these Christians, these pagans saying, Paul is right here, Paul said this. No, you got a you gotta copy of Paul letter that was translated 200 years or more after he lived. So don't you think we have to do some further investigation, especially when you have Paul in the Hebrew who say Shawal, especially when you have him contradicting Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, but now you give me a doctrine that Paul proved that we're under grace. So this is why we're taking this time to our time to tell people you just can't turn to the book of Acts fourth chapter, it says right here, blah, 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 slow down. Do you, have, do you have the original copy of Paul's letter? Do you have the original Greek Paul used? Because languages change over time. So in part two, let's play the intro. Just to set the tone. Israelites, as well as Christians, quoting verses and staring you down, screaming you down. Mm. I'm giving you scripture. I don't care about no Hebrew. It says it right here. John 1, 1, 1. It's like, well, we got to take a closer look because your doctrine that you're giving us inside the church ain't matching up what the Messiah said. So this is what we're doing here. And we're exposing, if y'all make it through this series with me, we're going to prove, not with my information, we're going to prove with these theologians' information, with these great doctors of theology, we're going to show you that these books we call Bibles, they're Frankensteins, they're monsters. That's what we're trying to do. So you can use your board if you're taking notes. I, I want you to get ready to write this word down. But the reason why these Bibles are so dangerous, family, these books called Bibles have been used to take people's life savings, mm. has been used to, used to take advantage of women, abuse children. How you getting all this, these different type of lifestyles from the same book? And you're reading the same book that I'm reading, but you got multiple wives over here. You got uh, tithing over here, no tithing over there. And our elders said these scriptures are not open to private interpretation. So how are we getting all these doc Somebody, hey, listen, we got to be men and women. Somebody's wrong. It don't make you a bad pastor, a bad preacher. You just didn't know. Maybe you were under curses and y'all wants to remove the curse. But when you got that pride in that collar, you got that pride in that degree on the wall, I can't retract now. I'm packing 1,500. We got pastors in the Coliseums. Y'all ever been to a sports game? We got pastors. Y'all, Creflo and my boy, every day's a Friday. Joe Osteen. <laughs> they're teaching in Coliseums. So they're too far gone to retract. 
the money them got them, they they lose their congregation. Mm -hmm. That's why I respect and I love these pastors who come out and says, I go down to one member. I'm not hiring no musicians who don't know about the Torah. I'm not hiring no drummer. I respect these pastors who've given up their congregation to teach this truth. So that's what we're doing, family. This, this, these books we call Bible, we shouldn't get all 15, 20 doctrines from 20 different men. Somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong. So write this word down, family. Write this word down. Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Anybody ever heard that word before? You heard that word before? Y'all heard that word before? Sanhedrin. What did, and, and look, we're all learning here. Raise your hand, those on, on side of the virtual first. Raise your hand. What 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 the Sanhedrin means? Anybody inside the virtual? I've heard it many times, but I honestly do not know. Say it again, I've used breaking up. I said I've heard it many times, but I honestly don't know it. You say you're every time you don't know it. Okay. Uh, anyone else online? Sister B, B Thompson, Gerald, you guys got a, a definition what you think Sanhedrin means? Sister B says she heard it before too. <laughs> she heard it before. So most of us, we all, those in the house, you guys heard it before? Anybody want to take a stab at a definition? See the, uh, the higher sect of the uh, uh, priesthood or something? If this was hot bread and butter, yeah. Elder has the belt. I'd be running to the base. <laughs> you guys never play hot bread and butter? <laughs> hot bread and butter is an old game where we used to hide the belt. Where somebody take their belt off and go hide it, and then they'd call the rest around, hot bread and butter, come get it. And we'd be looking for the belt. And the person who hit the belt would be like, oh, you hot, you hot. So right now, elder is hot. If, if I was playing, I'd be inching back to the base because elder is hot. Sanhedrin is a word that the pagans give us for the chief priests, the elders. But guess what, family? And you guys pull out your dumb phones, I mean your smartphones. Because I, I, I started doing it, but I, I wasn't able to finish in time. So I guess if I sort of uh, a little hasty, maybe this is going to prove to be the spirit or not. But I couldn't find this word anywhere in the Bible. I checked all the lexicons, and I typed in Sanhedrin, and it pulled up zero results in the Bible. So y'all do it real quick. Go to your favorite Bible app or whatever, and type in Sanhedrin and see if any verses come up. See if any verses come up. No verses come up for you? Zero. Zero. Anyone, anyone get any results yet? Yes. So I was like, and this is how the most I deal with me at work, like, because I'm, I'm always, I'm always in study mode. And I'm like, we know, like Elder says, Elder been around longer than us. If you go to civic, me? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm never the only one. I don't know how to use these phones. <laughs> my first smart, that's my first iPhone, y'all. Me and my wife, I broke down and got one. I don't know what to do with this. But um, so I was at the I was at the job and I was meditating on the class and I, you know how to you know get it in bite-sized chunks and how to make this you know palatable. And it's like today I'm, I I just want to continue to show you how adulterated our culture been. Like Elder says, the word Sanhedrin is a pagan word that they put on our elders of Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin, they're, they're in charge of the temple. So if me and Zamoya got caught in some mischief, we would have to go before the elders. But these pagans who take our scrolls and now you're a doctor, you want a collar, you want to be respected, 
you want to take a picture with your collar on, you got to go to seminary schools and Jesuit schools and learn about, oh, ancient Israel had the Sanhedrin priests. But when you do a word search for Sanhedrin, it's nowhere found in the Bible. It's another example, family, how we've done had our culture stripped from us, mm. chopped up with my down south Texas people, chopped and screwed, and gave back to us. Now, if you want to, you want a church, you gotta teach this. But this don't appear nowhere in the Bible. I, I'll show you what does appear in the Bible. So Mario, take us to well, eventually. Take us to Bamada Bar 11. Bamada Bar means in the wilderness. We know it as the book of Numbers. And for our family just coming here, our elders called those scrolls by the first sentence of that scroll. So when you turn to the book of Numbers, chapter one, you're going to find out that it says Moses, it starts in the wilderness. And that's how our elders, they label those scrolls in the wilderness or by Matabar. We know it as Numbers. Let's go to Numbers chapter 11 and verse 16. Numbers or by Matabar in the wilderness, chapter 11 and verse 16. Shema. Shema. Read. And Yahweh said unto Moses, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, who know whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, what they may stand there with thee. That they, that they may stand come. there with thee. And now, so this is when the most high. Now, this is after Uncle Masha or Moses, his, his father-in-law had already told him, Moses, you're gonna kill yourself trying to judge these people. So first time it was Jephro, his father-in-law said, You need me, you need some help. Choose you some wise men to help you police the people. Now he's getting it again from the Most High himself. Moses, choose out 70 elders that you know to be forthright. They're honest men. They fear me. And they're going to judge righteously. Now, for some context, let's drop down the verse 24, is it? Just to show you that the Most High was with them. Verse 25, Numbers 11 and 25. Shaman, right. read. And Yahweh came down in a cloud and spake unto them and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. Wait a minute, he, he gave them the Holy Spirit. He gave them the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Did y'all catch that? Mm -hmm. We're crushing high level Christianity right now. Mm -hmm. Abba himself the most high spirit has come down and he gave them his spirit, not a Holy Ghost spirit that got you shaking out your heels and wiggling on the floor. He gave them some of his spirit. And guess what? Christ ain't here. Christ hasn't even been born yet in the flesh. So I thought you needed Jesus to have the Holy Spirit. No, you need obedience and righteousness. All Messiah was doing was restoring that generation to what y'all should have been coming out the wilderness. If you're obedient, Abba's going to rain down on you. So Messiah just restored the new generation. But this thing about you need Jesus, that's why the Christian church is the finished works of Christ. I put on that, I put on a brother's pastor's post this morning. Can you show me two verses that mention the finished works of Christ? These are phrases y'all you learn in school you can't find in the Bible. So Abba Yah has come down and given these elders his spirit. We call it the Holy Spirit or the Most High Spirit. Read on. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. They shook and fell around on the ground and, and was blah, 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 blah. He going behind it. He's coming on a Honda. They prophesied and did not cease. <laughs> they just started giving words of edification. Ain't no unintelligible sounds coming out of these men. Mm. The father has blessed them with himself because I'm, I'm the great I am. Mm. 
Besides me, there is no other. Ain't no three in one. No, I'm the most high spirit and I'm going to give myself because he's, now he is omnipresent. I will use their little terms. Y'all know what omnipresent means? He's able to be everywhere at all times. So that's our God. So he gave himself, he poured himself into these elders and they began to speak edify. It wasn't no foam at the mouth and oh, he got it, he got it. No, they're edifying the people. This is before Christ was even born. Mm. Y'all get that, maybe in the replay. So the text says 70 elders, did it not? Correct. Did it say Sanhedrin? No. Did it didn't say Sanhedrin, right? But that's the Old Testament. Y'all know that's been nailed to the cross. Let's try the Christian Bible. What I mean by Christian Bible in seminary school, the Christian Bible is our Old Testament joined with the New Testament. That's the Christian Bible. The Hebrew Bible in their seminary schools, the Hebrew Bible just consists of what they call the Old Testament. For us, there is no Old or New Testament. We'll get to that later, but there is no Old or New Testament. But that's one of the questions if you wrote down the Hebrew Bible versus the Christian Bible. The Hebrew Bible is what we know, grew up in church with as the Old Testament. The Christian Bible is all the books, the old and the new. And there is no Old or New Testament. We'll get to that in the future class. But let's go, let's entertain seminary people. Let's go to the so-called New Testament. And let's go to Luke 19 and verse 47. Let's see if something changed. Because y'all know once Christ came, the finished works of Christ has changed everything. And the Hebrews got a whole new way of life. And praise God for the blood. And he could go Honda. I got a new Honda. Let's see. <laughs> I don't know what they were saying. I mean, I, I, I ain't gonna lie to you. I, 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 when I, me, me and Queen cleaned up, I was home one day praying. And I just went to it. <laughs> I just finished watching Joe, Joe Osteen. What was our circuit name? We don't wait till Joe Osteen, Joyce Myers, mm -hmm. Creflo, and Jakes. And then I, I do my, she have to go to work and I'll be there praying. And I just, <laughs> 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 I thought I had the Holy <laughs> oh, but that Christian dogma is serious, yo. That Christian dogma is serious. So they tell us uh, the Christ came, and now the New Testament is a whole new way of life. But we just read in the Old Testament, the Father Himself gave him, him, him spirit to these elders. They became the elders of Israel to help Moses out. They didn't use the word Sanhedrin. Let's go to the New Testament, who the Jesuits or the, the seminary folks says. But the New Testament was written in Greek. Okay, let's check this Greek out. Luke 19 and 47. Shaman? Shaman. Read. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. The Sanhedrin sought to destroy him. No, the chief priests and the scribes. Wow, they don't even use the Sanhedrin in the New Testament. Y'all tell us this was based on Greek. So where do you get this word Sanhedrin from? Let's get a second witness. Let's use the plumb line. Let's go to Acts 26, because this is after the resurrection. That's what happened. Yeah, no, no, no. After the resurrection is when everything changed. That's when everything changed. That's what they tell you. They give you a bunch of philosophy. Just read it to me. Read it to me. Acts 26 and verse 12. Let's see if we can get Sanhedrin in here. Acts 26 in verse 12, and this is after the crucifixion. I'm, I'm using a verse after the crucifixion because if you talk to these Polish seminary pastors, they're going to say, yeah, after he resurrected and ascended to heaven is when everything changed. That's when the law was no longer needed. That's when he opened up the whole salvation to the Gentiles, and that's when we're living under the new covenant. They, they got a bunch of commentary. They don't have nothing you can read to prove what they're saying. Acts 26, verse 12. Read. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Commission from who? Chief priest. Why did he say Sanhedrin? Good question. This is why we're going through this level of study, family. We're not refuting the word of the Most High. We're letting these pastors, Israelite Hebrews, all you mighty Judah men out there, and y'all screaming at people, all these scriptures. You don't know what you're saying. You, you don't know what you're teaching. You just can't open these books up and think you got a solid doctrine. What did old lady say, Queen? It doesn't work like that. None of this works like that. So this is why we're going through this 
heavy, heavy destroying Christian dogma. We're not trying to destroy pastors or Christians. We hope to save them, to pull them out of destruction. We're not trying to destroy Christians. We're not trying to hurt people, but conversations do get intense. I've been, I've been eavesdropping around different types of platforms. The brother that got me, I done downloaded uh, Discord, and, and now the brother sent me a link for uh, Clubhouse. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, like, I'm going in the rooms. I'm like, oh, let me get out. But there's, there's heated debates, and I want to I, I wanna say that I think some Christians have good hearts. I really think they have good hearts. And they really think they're trying to correct us. And it's like, you really can't fault them. They've been indoctrinated for like 20 some years. Grace, 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 grace. Faith, faith, faith. Abraham believed. Yeah, but did you read where he kept commandments? Again, all y'all came in here and sat right down, didn't you? You didn't check the chair when the leg was broke. You had faith that these were good chairs. And since you had faith, you took action and sat right down. Did you ease down to the chair? You put your whole weight down. So when you have faith, when you trust into something, you do something. I trust that my job has a payroll department and that their payroll ain't depleted, so I'm going to go to work Monday. But if someone texts me and says, hey, you know, the job is bankrupt, guess who won't be going to work Monday? <laughs> I don't work for free. <laughs> If I'm work for free, I stay around the house and work. Up. So we have faith in things, and so we move. I got faith that Christ is the Son, so I, I keep the contract that He said because He said multiple times, "If you love Me, keep My commandments." So I got faith that He is the Son. I got faith that He's coming back for righteous people. So I'm keeping these laws the best I can. Faith comes with action. That makes sense. All praises. So I did that exercise for him to show you that we've been learning our culture, the Hebrew Israelite scrolls and history through pagans, and they're giving us a bunch of Greek pagan words that sound heavy, sound like, well, that's a big word. You can't find it nowhere in these Bibles. The finished works of Christ is nowhere in these Bibles. St. Hedrian is nowhere in these Bibles. Where are you getting your doctrine from? So now we're going to go into a little bit of textual criticism. And we brought this out last year. Textual criticism, it sounds like a fancy word, textual criticism. You were born with that. You were born with that. Someone tells you, you know, the last day of school, everyone's excited, got their shirt, everybody rolling on their shirt. You ever notice someone that's real quiet and they ain't really like, they ain't really laughing and cutting up like everybody else. What that mean, y'all? I mean, they stayed back. <laughs> you the only one ain't acting a fool. Yeah, yeah you stayed back. So th that's that's textual criticism. I'm reading this text. Now, Pastor, I hear you moaning and groaning and rhythm with the keyboard. And grace, ah, that's all I need. Oh, grace. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but when I just go to the red letter, Pastor, I ain't going to deal with the, 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 the Messiah's soldiers. I want to deal with the Messiah. If I just live by the Messiah's words, he's saying keep the commandments. Right. So that's textual. You don't need no degree. You don't need to pay moody in all these Jesuit schools. You don't need no white collar. The Father has blessed you with understanding and common sense. Pastor, you say you work for Christ. But you're calling Christ a liar. We got a problem. We got a problem. Christ is saying keep the commandments. You're saying live by grace. So we're going to apply some textual criticism. And we're going to go examine Noah's diet. We're going to examine Noah's diet. Because this is one of the scriptures, and I'm confused, it baffles me. But a lot of seminary pastors take you here, and they think they're shutting down the dietary law. And they're going to say something like, you see? No one could eat anything. So the most high wasn't too concerned about animals, but something happened to Israel and he instituted a dietary law. It's like, that makes sense to you? 
it makes no sense. But they're going to take you to Genesis 9. And even though Noah's generation was generations before Jacob and Moses, they're going to take you to Genesis 9 and show you that the dietary law is not that serious. The Most High don't care about what you're eating. He care about righteousness. Well, what's righteousness? Righteousness is righteousness. No, well, what's righteousness? Righteousness is by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit said, I can smack fire out you. And I ain't righteous. How do you know that's not righteous? The Holy Spirit won't tell you to do that. How do you know? You need a barometer. The Holy Spirit is not going to tell me nothing that's against the commandments. Mm. Because the Holy Spirit is the Father. We just proved that with Numbers 11, when the Father himself came down, the Most High Spirit. That's why we call him the Most High. Have we ever called Jesus the Most High? No, we call him the Most High. We call him the Great I Am. So he came down and gave the brothers or the elders his spirit. And he can't be vacillating like that poem game. Moses, you can eat anything. I mean, Noah, you can eat anything. Now, Moses, y'all can't eat anything. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But we're going to use textual criticism to try to help the people. Genesis 9 and 3. Shammai? Shammai. Read. Every morning, oh, excuse me. every only <laughs> thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. What you say, I? Even as the green herb, I have given you all things. You see? You see? How can, Mo, how can Noah eat anything? And then he gave Israel commandments. Something had to happen, and that's why he gave the children of Israel commandments. But in the beginning, he didn't care what you eat. But it's not making sense. It's not making sense. So this Masoretic text is saying that every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. And I was using Queen's Bible at the time. I said, look at this. Anyone got a footnote in their Bible for Colossians 2.16? Or any New Testament scriptures? Anybody got any footnotes next to that verse? What, next to Genesis 3? Yeah, this is yours. I know yours has this. Is I got this from your Bible. Yeah. Anyone else has footnotes next to that verse? Point to the New Testament. So the George, take us to these two verses in the New Testament. Take us to Colossians 2.16 and then uh, the whole uh, 1 Timothy 4 and 3. So we got a text in front of us that's saying after the flood, the Most High is telling Noah, every moving thing that lives should be meat or food for you. And Christians think this is giving them a loophole that see, Christ, God, the Most High ain't worried about no food, y'all. And if you take this text at face value, you could be duped into these types of doctrines. But praise be to Abba Yah by the blood of his son. He's waking his people while his remnant. And we're going to break this down Hebraically. So the Jews, are you ready for Colossians 2.16? Yes. Colossians 2.16. Can you read that for us, sis? Am I? Am I? Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. You see, this is a red herring. This is a smoking gun that these books have been edited by Christians, by pagan Christians, who they think Genesis 9-3 is proven that Paul was teaching against the law, specifically the dietary law. So that's why in Gina's Bible, babe, what year was your Bible published? Like 80, that's an older about 86 or 90, something like that. First is Thomas Nelson. That's Thomas Nelson, right? Uh, yeah, 1798. So that's Thomas Nelson, and I guess they got an edition from 1798. They put these footnotes in her Bible. These are red herons that your books, our scrolls, have been edited by pagans, Christians who will say, see, Genesis 9 is confirming that Paul knew the dietary law, it wasn't important. And Paul is not saying that. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 4. 1 
First Timothy four verses three to four. Shema. 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 Forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which Yahweh hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So here's another witness these Christians think they're giving us that this is why Paul was teaching against the dietary law because in Genesis 9 and 3, God told Noah he can eat anything on the earth. So this confirms that Paul indeed is teaching grace and teaching that the law was temporal and not because of the finished works of Christ that you can't find me no scriptures that tell you the finished works of Christ. This is Christianity. This is Christian dogma, family. Let me, let me ask these pastors this, because this is going to be public. I mean, we don't have a, a, a huge crowd, but if someone catches this and, and has the spirit to hear, for these seminary pastors who, who continuously say the finished works of Christ, the finished works of Christ, if Christ's works are finished, why is he coming back? That makes sense to y'all? Because if I'm done, I'm done. Wow. I ain't gonna say it. When the sister's fed up, <laughs> that just hit me on y'all. I got daughters. <laughs> but when someone's done, they're done. Huh? So if you talk about the finished works of Christ, but the angels told men of Israel, men of Galilee, why y'all stand there gazing at the sky? The same son of man you see us sitting in the clouds, he's going to return the same way. So pastor, Dr. Seminary, why do you keep telling me about the finished works of Christ when A, you can't find no verses that even talk about the finished works of Christ, and B, this Christ we're waiting on is coming back. This is the level we go through to show these people you're under the works of Satan. Your schools are the works of Satan. Your pastor, we love him, but he's under the works of Satan. No scriptures talk about the finished works of Christ. But back to this dietary law and Noah's diet. Verse 4. Verse 4. For every creature of Yahweh is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Every creature of the Most High is good. So next week, Queen, let's have some bat soup. It says every creature, didn't it say? Yeah. How about you know, want to try some fried pit bulls? It's just every creed. I'm, I'm reading right here. Y'all heard the intro. He just gave you scripture. Every creature. Well, uh, I've read that we're creatures. Mm. So should we be frying up Zamaria's arm next week? Sir. <laughs> we ain't going to use a good arm. We use the, the one you don't play with. Because we're creatures. Aren't we creatures? Aren't we, y'all went to their schools, right? Aren't we mammals? Our females carry their young inside. We got blood. We're mammals, right? So every creature is good for food. Oh, see, now you're being silly. You're taking it out of context. That's what you're doing when you're reading every Christian all. So Noah's diet did not consist of every moving thing. And this is an instance we do prefer the, the Septuagint. We are finding the Septuagint is closer to the original scrolls than the Masoretic text. But this is an example when the Septuagint too can't touch the culture. I put on Facebook this week, culture over tainted text. I want, I want the original culture of the Israelites who were righteous over your tainted text. Don't give me a Schofield Bible. Schofield was a wicked derelict, a drunk. Don't give me King James and all these editors he had. I want the culture of the righteous Israelites. So uh, can you read this verse from the Septuagint? This is Genesis 9, 3 from the Septuagint. And every reptile which is living shall be to you for meat. I have given all things to you as the green herbs. Family, what's wrong with that? We can eat eels right. and snakes because according to your school, them, them reptiles, right? right? We can eat alligators and whatnot. So the Septuagint is my preferred book translation, but even the, the Septuagint is not the be all the end all. That's why I give me culture over tainted text. So 
what's going on here? Did, did the Most High tell Noah he can eat anything? Well, if he did, family, our Father, forgive me, Abba, y'all, this is for demonstration purposes. Take us to Malachi 3.6. Take us to Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3, 6, towards the end of the, the so-called Old Testament. Because if, if I'm just going to say, y'all know I'm not disrespecting our father or his son, but I said it last week. If we take these books called Bibles at face value, what's in these printed texts, they make our father and, our, and his son, I'm going to use their terms, that is our God here. That's our government, the Abiyah and his son. They're not the same people. They're not on the same level. It's Abiyah and his son. Well, let me give it, because the text says it's Abiyah on the right hand is his son, right? So they're not the same. But the way these texts read, don't make our authority, our government sound like schizos. You want to tell Noah he can eat at anything, but now when Moses' generation come up, you give them specific. It don't, it don't, Malachi 3, 6. Shema. Shema. Read. For I am Yahweh. I change not. I do what? I change not. The next generation? I change not. Oh, after Christ? I change not. These seminary doctrine people got our father and his son sound like schizophrenics. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that when my son come back, don't worry what I told Moses. He don't say when you see my son give up the ghost, then everything is under him now. He says, I change not. So this, these are the verses that got me like, wait, we got to take a closer look at what's going on here, family. Let's back up to Genesis. Let's back up to Genesis chapter 7 and verse 2. They're telling us that Noah got permission from the father to eat all things. Every creature. Horses too. Y'all want to eat a horse, a horse head or nothing like that? It's all creatures. And do you know what some of us say? Well, you know it's against the law. <laughs> so you follow the law of Rome right. that you can't kill domestic animals, but you don't follow the law of the most high. That's what they're gonna tell you. Well, you know, you, you can't you can't eat pit bulls. Who, who, who said? You said you can do all things through Christ. Yeah. This is the level we go through. We try to keep this cordial, but when I when I hear them scoffing us and trying to belittle us because we don't have no DD and HD, trying to make us seem like we're quacks, then I, I got to raise up and make you, you sound silly. Pastor, we love you. You sound real goofy. Genesis 7 and 2. Read. Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two. Wait a minute, something ain't right. Read that again. And of the beasts that are not clean by two. So going into the art, you tell Uncle Noah, take the clean beasts in groups of seven, right? Mm -hmm. Take the clean animals in groups of seven. Seven couples, right? Mm -hmm. And then the unclean animals take them in just pairs. This is Genesis 7. But then you take me to Genesis 9, and he can eat all creatures. When did the animals get clean in the boat? When did the animals get clean in the boat? Pastor, you got to answer these questions. How can Noah? Get an order, separate the clean from the unclean. Now, after the flood, everything can be eaten. Your dodge is not making sense. Your dodge is not making sense. Just two chapters later, he can eat anything, but he had a command about what's clean and not clean. Pastor, you got to answer this. Let's back up to Genesis 1 Genesis 1 This is going back to the vocabulary for today. Genesis 1, 29. It's on the screen too. Genesis 1, 29. Read. 
And Yahweh said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. To you it shall be meat only. Because yeah. this is the verse that vegetarians take you to. Y'all ever ran into vegetarian Israelites? So vegetarian Israelites, again, this, this destroying Christian dogma is for everybody. We're not discriminating because you're a Hebrew and you keep commandments. If you're teaching doctrine that can't be found in these texts, this series is for you. You're out here adding to the Most High's word. But vegetarians or, or what do you got, vegans or Episcopalians, all these people, they take you here and say, see, and I ain't gonna lie, when I was coming in, I thought that's what this meant, that we was only supposed to eat vegetables and herbs. But then after Adam sinned, that's when we can eat meat. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, I've given you fruit trees to, to as well to eat. Because if he says only for me, he would have said only for me. He didn't say only for me. He said, I've given you fruit bearing trees to be food for you, right? And he said, every herb bearing seed. But this is not exclusive, meaning don't eat no meat. So I took you here to. to we're not discriminating because you're a Hebrew and you're mighty strong and all the fringes on. If you're teaching false doctrine, brother, you're teaching false doctrine. No, but how, how are we to be vegetarians? Well, what's on the menu for Passover? Lamb. <laughs> That's not an option. He said, this is my Passover. Eat this lamb with your shoes on. So King Hebrew Israelite, how are you a vegetarian? You're going to push this to people. No, no, you ain't supposed to be eating meat. Miss me with all that. So this is not telling us to be vegetarians. Father just running down what he's doing for us. I'm giving you fruit trees, okay? Now, Genesis 1.20. Let's get to Genesis 1.20. Genesis 1.20. Read. And Yahweh said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Uh huh. Go on. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh created great wells and every living creature that moved, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after the, his kind. And Yahweh saw that it was good. This is the verse that I believe the, the word Ramash first appears. The pagans have used the phrase creeping things, and that's the same word that you find. When you get to Genesis 9 and 3, the Noah, every moving thing. It didn't say every moving thing. The Hebrew said, Ramash. I'm giving, I give, I'm giving you the Ramash, the first things I separated from the water to be food for you. But he still had a, a command what was clean and what was unclean. He didn't say now that the flood is over, everything is clean, because those animals, clean and unclean, was with him. They were saved. And you don't give me no text that says, now all the un there is no more unclean animals. Y'all found it anywhere? This is the level of scholarship we got to go through to, to help these seminary people. So that's where the vocabulary word came from. It's like, it's not, and when, when something pricks you in your spirit, put it back in the pictograms, pictographs. When these verses, because Malachi 3, 6, I change not. And if we find the most high is changing, it means something, something's deeper. Either the text is, is mutilated, or maybe it's a change for us, but it was already part of his plan. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. We're playing catch up. It can't be both. If he said I changed not, and now Noah, you, you can eat everything, but now this generation, y'all can't, that's a change. Something ain't added. So when you find these scriptures, put it back in the pictographs, and the truth comes out. Noah wasn't able to eat every moving creature. He was able to eat the Ramash, and we gave you the context of Ramash. The pagans don't know our language. They, they're using Ramash for creeping things, worms, reptiles. Their language can't keep up with us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments about that? This is the level of textual criticism we go through to get to the truth. How many people are, are tired of being lied to? If you don't know, say you don't know. Say, say I'm doing the best I can or produce your witnesses of, of, of why you're doing what you're doing, and I decide if I'm going to roll with that. But don't make me feel like I'm not born again in the truth because I ain't marching to your beat. 
That's why we use a plumb line. If it don't make sense to you, you do it because it was already good. Abba is so good to us. Hallelujah. We already got, if you go to the book of Numbers, I forgot what chapter, but we the, the, the priests had daily sacrifice for sins of ignorance. Y'all know what that means? I mean, if we're doing something that we didn't know that displeased him, that sacrifice covered that. And now Messiah is that sacrifice. So if it's things we're doing wrong that we don't know, Messiah is, is covering that. But don't push your doctrine on me because that's how you're reading it. Give me your witnesses. And I decide this for me. So let's move on to a little bit of more textual criticism. Just showing you why this study is needed. Showing you why this study is needed. Let's go to the so-called New Testament. And we brought this out last week, but it came back up in something I was listening to. I was like, yeah, why didn't I do this last week? Let's go back to Matthew 11 and 13. And I told y'all, this is the verse that all the seminary pastors run to and think that Messiah himself is teaching against the law. He's telling you, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. In the Torah, in Hebrew, that's saying I'm Torah. But now he's going to tell you that the Torah is done. It don't make sense. That's what Torah means, family, a direction, a way. And when he said, John 14 and 6, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light, he was telling those Pharisees, y'all too carnal, I'm the Torah. Follow what I'm doing. Follow what I'm saying, and you shall get eternal life. So how he's going to tell them that he's the Torah and also that the Torah is no longer needed, it don't make sense. Matthew 11 and 13. Shema. Shema. Read. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. For all the law and the prophets prophesied until John. And uh, this is where all of them take you to. And they say, see, even Messiah is letting you know that he knew, he knew he was going to end the law. What verse gives you the Messiah thoughts, Pastor? That, that's how they, they say things like that. You listen like, he knew that he was going to end the law, and you don't have no verses for that. But they take you here because it's red letter. Messiah is saying that all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So in seminary circles, this is for them a proof text that the law was temporary. There's a Hebrew copy of Matthew out there. I've been sharing it for years. I got it on my flash drive here. You can go out and grab it yourself. Uh, I, I just downloaded it again. I got it on my phone, actually, so I can send it. If you guys got the Apple phone, I can, I can airdrop it to you. <laughs> Man, I can airdrop that. <laughs> so there's a Hebrew copy of Matthew out there. And actually, there's three Hebrew copies of Matthew. Two of them was translated in the 1500s, 1600s, one from memory. But this copy that I have, well, I got, I think I got all three of them. But this copy that we're going to reference here is more weightier than the other two because theologians, I can't speak Greek or, or read Greek. I'm learning now by doing these comparative analysis. I'm picking up Greek words. I hate it, but uh, I can read a little bit of Greek now. And um, the other two copies of Hebrew, the theologians say, when you line them up, you can tell that all they did was translated the Greek copy into Hebrew. This copy that we're about to put on the screen didn't do that. This copy is about a, I don't know if he's a fish, but he, he is a Jew and he didn't use the Greek text. He had, he, it's obvious he had an older copy of Matthew from the Hebrew, and he wrote his in Hebrew. So that's why this copy of Matthew has more weight than the other two copies. But in the Hebrew copy of Matthew 11, 13, uh, what is saying in the Hebrew copy? For all of the prophets and the law prophesied concerning John. Y'all see the difference? Mm -hmm. The Greek version is saying they prophesied until John, but the Hebrew is saying they prophesied concerning John. And that makes more sense because, and again, generations have different usages of the word law. Some generations use the word law just for the five books of Moses. But then the other generations after Moses 
they started using law for everything, for the for the tour, for the for the five and for the prophet. So that context makes sense because we got the prophet saying that, behold, one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way. And then John comes from where? John came from the wilderness looking all crazy with camel hair on, eating honey and locusts, saying, look, there's one coming greater than me. So this Hebrew copy is more exact to what actually took place. The lost talked about John and John came from the wilderness teaching about someone's coming. So your Greek manuscript is not even fitting what happened. So here's the copy of it. If you go online and grab it, you want to use this copy. And then all they did was just scan the whole book. And it's the pagan who published it, His name is George Howard. But the actual, I don't know if he's a fish or a real, a real Israelite or not. But his name is Shem Tob. Shem Tob. T-O-B or T-O-V, because you know the pagans turned the V into a B. But for our language, it's Shem Tov or Shem Tawab. So his name is Shem Tov. He translated this, but this copy was released by this man named George Howard. And again, you got one of those super duper phones, I can drop it to you. But he goes in and he, George Howard gives you the backstory of how this, this Hebrew copy came about. And he, he's the one singing praises that Shem Tov's copy is different than the other ones. The other ones, the other Hebrew copies of Matthew, the book of Matthew, it's like, it's really like a, a, a mirror of the Greek text. And this copy is not a mirror of the Greek text. It's using different words. Case in point, the law and prophet spoke concerning John versus the law and prophet spoke until prophesied until John. Things are not adding up when you get this copy, right? So I screenshotted the page for y'all. And this is Matthew 11, verses 13. It's at the top. You'll see it's marked there. And it's saying, Shakal Hanabayim wa Haturah, the Barwa Allah Yakanah. The last, the last word on that top of the line is John's name in Hebrew, Yakanah. Shakal all Hanabayim is prophets. Waha Torah, the Barwa spoke Allah concerning Yakana. Yakana. And this is why it's important to learn Hebrew, and you're going to learn the other generations by default. Because you see the green arrow? Remember, we, we read right to left. So that green arrow is an adulterated font, but to put it back in the original, it's the picture of the eye. It's the picture of the eye. It's the glyph of the eye. So the first character is the picture of the eye there, right? Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. The second one is what? The stab. The stab. The Ain't the it look stab? crazy? Yes. Yeah. You see how they are adulterated our language? The second picture is supposed to be the L sound, the picture yeah. of the stab. So the Hebrew word, we're not sure of the pronunciation. I say I for the I, you pronounce I. I, and then the, the shepherd stack is La. So I say Allah, not Allah like the power. I lie, I lie. Or the pagans are trying to run it together and, and, and shorten the sounds and say Allah. ill, ill or Allah, ill or Allah. But the Hebrew copy uses I and La. We do have a word for a till, a till meaning like a till Messiah comes. And that word would be the eye, picture of the eye in the tent door. Because with the eye, the eye means I'm experiencing something. And it also could mean longevity because we take for granted, we, we're seeing a far a long way away. When you look up to the sky, you're looking miles up. So the picture of the eye means experiencing or longevity. So if he was going to say a till, he would have used Ida or Ida because the door represents a pathway. 
and the, the, the tent wall, the tent door flapping in and out is a metaphor for time going in and out. This Hebrew writer didn't use the Ada, he used the Allah. One letter in Hebrew is miles apart. Y'all see that? Just one little letter, you have a whole different meaning. But when you pagans take, well, let's put the blame back on us. When we break our law and get kicked out our land and got to go to Greco-Roman schools, this is what happened. So you got me in your little New Testament Christian Bible saying that the law and the prophets were until John with a connotation that, see, the law and prophets got us up till John. Now John prophesied of becoming Messiah. Now we don't need that law because the Messiah is here. And that text didn't say that. The law and the prophets spoke concerning John. It's light years apart. Light years apart. To give you a witness, this is right off of, um, this is Bible Hub. And Bible Hub uses the same uh, concordance as, as Blue Letter Bible. I think it's is it down there. They're using, they're using the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek dictionaries. I think it's the same one as the Chaldee lexicon. But our word for a till, for time, is A-D, Ad, or Ada. And that's the word a Hebrew would use if he's referring to time. The Hebrew writer didn't use the word for time. He used a word meaning concerning. The law and the prophets spoke concerning John. Y'all see the difference? This is textual criticism that you don't get inside the Christian church. And these seminary people, they don't learn the concrete Hebrew. They're learning, I told you, Dr. Seminary is learning the, the Yiddish, Greco Yiddish with the vowels and the dot points. And they don't get this understanding because this is the original, this is the set apart language. The other gener generations are adoration. You don't get the same context of the Hebrew speakers. Any questions or comments concerning that? This is why these Bibles, you just can't open up these Bibles. And I'm, I'm giving you scripture. The scripture says right here, these Bibles, <laughs> to, to use to, to turn their heads on them, these Bibles were our schoolmasters. Now, the Most High is waking his people up, and we're getting revelation from his son, showing us that your text ain't making sense. The text you're giving us and your breakdown you're giving us is contradicting the one who died for us. So again, you see the, the, the uh, scripture in reference? that Those two little letters makes a world of difference. The law and the prophets spoke concerning John, Allah, they spoke concerning John. Those two little letters make a world of difference, world of difference. This is high level Christian dogma we're chopping down, we're chopping down. He didn't use the Greek, the Hebrew letters for until, he used another word, Allah, concerning John. The law and the prophets spoke concerning John. And this is the verse, in the, and that's, you guys, you get that, the copy, it has the Hebrew letters on, on one side and the English on the other side. That's why I'm telling you, you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn the other letters by default. Because the other letters look like this generation, you're gonna learn by default by, by comparing the text. And get back to the English. This is the English. Matthew 11, 13 from a Hebrew copy of Matthew. For all the prophets and the law spoke concerning John. You see how much doctrine we've been getting from them? And they, they, they've given us tainted text, tainted text. So I think we're going to cut this short. We're going to keep chopping down. And I, I want to go in order. But again, when I'm, when I'm building my notes, I, the most high just be giving me the order and, and things to bring out. So I, I, got, I got notes for days and he's still giving me stuff. One of, those, one of those big fancy words they, they told us about the Bible is that the Bible is infallible. And infallible, we're going to go over to one of these apologetic uh, websites, but infallible means it's incapable of being wrong. These Bibles are incapable of being wrong. And that's how they dupe people all these years. Pastor got a PhD and pastor have been to Africa. Pastor have been, none of that matters. Your pastor don't, don't know the truth. So we're going to take a look 
and test their theory from their, their Jesuit schools that the Bible is infallible. We're going to take a look at Elder Shaval's or Paul's conversion. We're going to take a look at his conversion. Now, according to seminary and these Christians, this uh, Hebrews 2, let me be fair. I'm here Israelites too. These Israelites just want to win arguments and win debates. The Bible has no mistakes in it. And they do. The Bible does. The Bible has a lot of mistakes in it. A lot of mistakes. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And we're going to take a look at when Uncle Shawal Paul was converted from being a persecutor of the church to the number one advocate for the Messiah. Most high is good, isn't he? So he went from being the number one persecutor of Messiah and his people to the number one advocate. Most high is word. We're going to start with Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. Shema? Shema. Read. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this, that this is very Christ. Most high is good. Turned this man around in one day, was it? A couple days? So, Uncle Shawal has been converted to an Israelite champion, a Nazarite, and he's trying to confound the Jews who he used to run with. He's trying to go back to his homeboys and confess, I got it wrong. That man is the one. He is Messiah. Read on. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. To do what? To kill him. Be careful who you're around. These Hebrews are very wicked people when you go against their doctrine. We call it, we call it the homeboy syndrome. You, you, can't, you can't contradict me because we're cool. No, this ain't about being cool. I want the truth. If you don't know, you don't know. If I got it wrong, I'll say, hey, do uh, you see this? Oh, praise God, I didn't see that. We got to correct this. So his homeboys he used to run with, now they want to kill him. Read on. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Uh huh. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Read on. And then Saul, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he is saved to join them, to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. When he came, when he did, when he came where? He came to Jerusalem. He is saved to join himself to disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Acts, Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Highlight it, check it, put a note under it. It's, this text has a saying when Saul, who became Paul, when he was come to Jerusalem, when he came to Jerusalem, the people were scared of him. They didn't know what to do with him. Acts 9 and 26 says Paul went to Jerusalem. This is right after his conversion. Right after his conversion, y'all just got to, if y'all read the, the back chapter, he just regained his sight. And now he's testifying. He's preaching about Christ. And this text, Acts 9, 26, saying he went to Jerusalem and the people were scared of him. He went to Jerusalem and they were scared of him. Acts 9, 26. Let's go to our next witness. Let's go to Acts 22. Acts 22, and we're going to pick it up at 17. Acts 22 and verse 17. Read. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. He came where? To Jerusalem. Again, second time. And they say, according to their seminary circle, they attribute that Acts was written by Luke. So here's a second time Luke is saying that 
Paul went to Jerusalem. After his conversion, after the Most High or Messiah afflicted him and, and converted him, he went to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem. This is the second time, right? Verse 18, did we read that? No, sir. And saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning now, me. Now, this is Paul retelling what happened to him. And in my Bible, they still put this in red letter. Right. That, that's for y'all too. Yeah. So because Paul is retelling that he heard Messiah from heaven, they put this in red letter, but Messiah is in heaven. Y'all see, y'all system makes no sense. Y'all system make no sense. But Paul is telling them that he heard Messiah tell him to get out of Jerusalem. Y'all see that? Second time, Luke has Paul after his conversion, being inside Jerusalem. Let's get the third witness. Let's go to Acts 26. Acts 26 and verse 20. Acts 26 and verse 20. Shaman? Shaman. Read. But show first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to Yahweh and do works, meet for repentance. Here's a third time. If Acts is written by Luke, I'm just going to I'm just going to entertain their their seminary doctrine right now. This is the third time Luke supposedly had Paul after his conversion is teaching and doing work in Jerusalem. Everyone's with me. Everyone's with me. Third time, this text in your Christian Bible is saying after he was converted, Paul, Shawal, went and did work in Jerusalem. Let's compare this to one of his so-called, or Acts for Luke, Luke wrote Acts, he said. Let's go to one of Paul's letter, because Luke would be, what, second hand or third hand? Let's get an eyewitness, Paul himself. Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, and we'll pick up at verse 11. Galatians chapter 1, and, and this for context, because we want to be fair, let's read his intro, Galatians 1 and 1. Let's read his intro. Shaman? Shaman. Read. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but of Yahweh and Hamashiach, and Yahweh, Father, who raised him from the dead. So this is Paul intro, and it's, it's a strong intro. I'm, I'm an apostle. Apostle meant sent. In Greek, it meant sent. So here's Paul supposed to say, listen, I'm not an apostle of men. No one called me. No one laid hands on me and, and let it go, let it go. I was, I was chosen by the Messiah himself and the Father. So Paul, in, in their seminary circle, this is Paul like, set the record straight well he came and thumbed his nose up at the 12 because the 12 was chosen the 11 was chosen by christ the matthew the 12th one replaced judah but paul is sort of like listen i y'all didn't y'all didn't choose me y'all didn't ordain me the messiah himself picked me right so this is paul's letter let's drop over i hope y'all sitting down for this let's drop over just a couple more verses Galatians 1 and 18. Galatians 1 and 18. But let's go back up and get some context. Let's start in that verse uh, 14. Let's get some context. Galatians 1 and 14. Read. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. So this is when the church tell you that Paul is teaching against the Torah. Paul is not teaching against the Torah of Yah. He was following what, family? He was following the Jews' religion, a.k.a. rabbinic Judaism, a.k.a. the oral law. He was saying, listen, I was good at what I did. I learned the traditions of the fathers, not the righteous fathers, 
I learned the wicked Judaism. Wash your hand 15 times and tie your shoe with the right hand, then tie your shoe with the left hand. Where is this at? Oh, this is what God told Moses when he came down. Yo, y'all didn't get this. I'm going to need some witnesses. So Paul said, I was good in the oral law. I was, I, I excelled. I was the best sinner there. <laughs> you know the best sinner? I was the best sinner. <laughs> so that's what Paul is saying. Paul is making it, he's not, he's not teaching against the Torah. He's saying what the, what the wicked rabbis taught, I mastered that. And I persecuted the righteous Nazarites who was following the law under Messiah. That's what he's saying here, family. Read on. But when it pleased Yahweh, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace mm -hmm. to reveal his son in me that mm -hmm. I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Say what? I conferred not with flesh and blood. Y'all see where we're going? Y'all see where we're going? Read on. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. What you say, huh? I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Uh-huh. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. After when? After three years. After when? After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. We got a problem, yo. We got a problem. This is the Christian Bible that you're, you're basing your salvation on. You just told me that this Bible is infallible. It's inspired by God. These holy men wrote this. And you got Luke saying three times that he went to Jerusalem after he was converted, but then he showed up to the Galatian church. I didn't even go to see those elders. He's sort of like bragging. When Christ, was, well, he wouldn't say Christ. He would say, because he told the Hebrew party. When Mashiach pulled me, I didn't go check with the elders of Jerusalem. I didn't even go that way. I went to Arabia for three years. What's, what else is wrong with that? If you stay in Arabia for three years, What's the commandment for us brothers? Three times a year, we must report before the Most High three major feasts. We got Pesach, we got Passover, we got first fruits known as Pentecost in church, and we got tabernacles. Those are three major feasts. It says every male must appear before the Most High. So, Paul. When your life was on the line, you stood up and boldly told uh, what, what, who you stood before. Was it the one before? Uh, was it Herod? Not Herod. He stood before. But he stood up boldly and says, I have kept all the laws of my forefathers. You see, that we can, I can go on and on. You're basing your salvation on these books, and you're telling me these books have no errors in them. Paul, if you stayed in Arabia for three years, you didn't keep the feast for three years. Now, how are you going to be telling, I kept all the laws. I have violated none of the laws of my father. These are contradictions. These are errors. You see how they, their doctrine ain't making sense. Paul telling them, I stayed in Arabia for three years. You just confessed that you didn't come home for the feast. So which one is it, Dr. Seminary? Are these Bibles infallible? Or your king champion of the gospel is confessing that he's a sinner? This is what you want to base your salvation on, these books called Bibles that's infallible and errant and inspired. So family, I think we're going to park here. You can click this. I, I was going to give credit and be uh, scholarly. I don't respect none of this. Everything he taught us this school is garbage. I don't respect nothing from them. But I was going to cite the website that I clipped this from, but it's pointless because if you Google, the, if you Google any apologetic site, the Bible's infallible and errant, all the apologetic sites are going to come up. So it don't really matter where I got this from, but let's let's read what they're telling us, and we just prove them to be liars. The three eyes of scripture. Can you read that out? Sir, inspired. When we say that the Bible is inspired, we mean that Yahweh and his and his definitive author 
while Yahweh used human beings to record his words, it is Yahweh himself who is behind what they wrote. So God don't know if Paul went straight to Jerusalem or if he went to, so most high, like, listen, I'm trying to make this point. I lost my mind to sin, to lawlessness. I'm trying, I got my kids, my grandkids coming. I'm trying to make this plain as possible. I'm trying to make this child proof. If your God didn't know that Paul didn't go to Jerusalem, who wrote this New Testament? You're telling me these apostles are holy men, righteous men. Family, I, I, I tell people, I'm going to take some liberty here. This ain't no Torah law, so I'm letting you know this is coming from your brother. I believe if the elders, the apostles knew that you had took their letters and attached them to the holy prophets, they would smack you. They would smack you. They knew we had a book that had their letters mm. attached to the holy prophets. They would put hands on you. And this is what you basically your salvation on. It's arrows all through it. And you tell me God didn't know where Paul went after he converted him? Three times you got Luke saying he was, he was in Jerusalem. Then he come to tell Galatians, I ain't even go see those elders in Jerusalem. I went over in Arabia. Which one is it? Your life is on the line. They playing with people's salvation. Read on, Ah. Yeah, Howard didn't just inspire the big ideas behind the Bible, but the very words of the scripture. To be clear, we don't believe these human writers became like robots or fell into a trance and mindlessly penned Yahweh's message. Yahweh breathed out his message, moving them along to record what he wanted, yet without making them something less than human agents. God don't even know where Paul, his, his champion, he don't even know where he went after he opened his eyes up. Ain't that amazing? He's so powerful to blind him, and then he's powerful enough to have someone open his eyes, but you don't know where he went. Went to Jerusalem. Oh no, I went to Arabia for three years. They tell us that these New Testament writers are inspired just like the prophets. Lies. How did the prophets write, y'all? What how do the prophets open up when they start writing? What elders say last week? The most high. Thus saith the most high. You won't find out one of them letters where the apostles say, Thus saith the most high. John even opens up and saying. Many people have thought to write what we believe. I saw fit to write too. John even tells you that. Let's go to it. Let's go to John. Let's go to John's intro. This is going to be the last slide for the day. All oh, praise be to Abba, y'all. We're trying to help these people. We got loved ones about to be killed. Time is short, family. Time is short. And then you won't want to beat down our door when they don't come looking for us now we're to a group no 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 y'all seen that movie bird box whatever it is don't come knocking on the door now we got videos and, and facebook posts and instagram posts y'all laughing at us that one is real what you saying about the no 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 <laughs> no 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 <laughs> We're not fools, even though it, when the rain came down, y'all go get in the book of um, Jasher. Noah, Noah's preached 120 years. Wow. When, the, when the flood came, let us say, no, we believe. Noah said, no, you believe now because it's raining. Yeah. So our people ain't no fool. Even Messiah says, y'all ain't come over here for me. Y'all come about that fish and bread. Mm -hmm. So we ain't no fools. Don't don't because we love you. Don't think we fools. Don't think we fools. Let's read how uh not John, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry, Slocky. Let's read how Luke, Luke opened up his letter. Luke chapter one. Come, come. This is Luke intro. Shema. Shema. Read. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. So Luke ain't saying the Most High has blessed men to record. Luke is saying many of our brothers have sat down to write what we believe mm. about our Messiah. That's what Luke is saying. You got something, Queen? Dog, dog, where's your bone? Luke, Luke is saying, listen, let, let me write down two before it get too muddled up because I know Matthew done wrote something. I heard John done wrote something. I'm just being... Liberty, I don't know what order it came in. 
the, the history say Matthew was first. Other than that, I'm not sure how it went down, but I got research that said Matthew wrote his, his gospel first. But Luke is saying many men have sat down. He didn't say Yah has breathed on these men. He hasn't said many men have spoke for the most high. Many men have sat down to put in order to declare what we believe as Nazarites, followers of Hamashiach. Read on. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So we know he's talking about the apostles because they were the only ones eyewitnesses. Uh -huh. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Tasipi, Theophilus, Theophilus family. He just said, it seemed good to me. He didn't say the most high told me to do this. He didn't say, thus saith Abba Yah. He said, it seemed good to me too, because I either I seen it myself or I was talking to the apostles. Wow. So let me back up the apostles. Let me be on the front line. I take the ridicule of scorn. You believe that man rose from the dead? Yeah, he did rise from the dead. Luke is saying, it seemed good to me. Not the Father has breathed on me. When those, are, those holy men spoke, they, they let you know, thus saith the Most High, Babylon is going to come take y'all into captivity because y'all have broken my law. That's how the holy, if these elders were alive, they are alive, they sleep now. When these elders come back, especially Shawal, y'all, man, he's going to be smacking people. <laughs> he's going to be smacking people left and right. What you was doing? So this is why we don't esteem these letters. These letters are epistles. We thank the elders for them because it confirms our faith, but we don't need these letters. Everything that we see in the, in the prophets, we know it came true. How we know it? The other nations recorded it. Oh. It's a writing, if I can remember, not only was it dark in Jerusalem after the crucifixion, it was reported it was dark in Rome. There's the Mediterranean, that's our coast right there. Rome is across the other side. Wow. It was dark across the Mediterranean. And they recorded. Don't they call it? It was an eclipse. Yeah, it was an eclipse. Right? It was the most high saying, my son, I'm, I'm taking the light out of the world. Y'all didn't respect him. I'm, take, I'm bringing him back home. The Romans record this. Mm. But our apostles are liars. Mm -hmm. <sighs> This is the level we go through, family. I love our people. Satan has a hold on these men. You're so pious and so religious. You so uh, got all that charisma, and you can't see Satan got a hold of you. These right, these New Testament letters are not inspired by God. If your God is confused, then he don't even know where his number one man. <laughs> right? I know you athlete. You have me, you have me, not no more. You're old now. <laughs> but I know tomorrow you, you play ball. Can you imagine? <laughs> Coach put you in the game. Where you mean at? I don't know. <laughs> I don't put you in the game. You don't know your man. <laughs> the most high is controlling the game, and he don't even know where his number one man is at. That's what you're. Let's put it this up. Uh, oh my goodness. Um, inerrant. When we say the Bible is an errant, we mean Yahweh used these human authors to pen exactly what Yahweh wanted without any mixture of error. Mm -hmm. Yahweh used these men with all of their personalities, their writing styles, their accumulated vocabularies, their life experiences, their illustrious illustrations and metaphors to express his message. Uh, what did Luke just say in his intro? He said, which part? It seemed good to me. Yes. Yeah, he didn't say God used me. Right. Right. Did he say God used me, baby? He said, it seemed good to me. Now, don't get me wrong. He says, whatever you put your hand to do, I'll bless. So we don't sit on our hands and don't do nothing for the Father. But that's what we're doing now. We're standing up you guys. They said, I believe in Messiah. I believe he's the son of the most high. And I believe these laws are alive. Right. 
I believe he's coming back for so we don't hide or sit on our hands. We we're we're, we're seeing fruit that he's with us. Right. So Luke wasn't wrong to write a record, but Luke Luke is telling you God ain't telling me to do this. But now you're gonna make Luke. God told him to do that. I'm telling you, I didn't score 20 points. You did score 20 points. When? That's what these these seminary people are making. Christ saying, uh, uh, "My finished works." And well, uh, you saying, "If you love me, keep keep the law." Like what? And then it's sad because you have some of these churches that say they're they're they only New Testament churches. They, they only New Testament only. New Testament only. You don't even know your New Testament. This is sad, family. Let's finish this up. We're going to close out here, family. To express his message and as he wanted it, yet without error. In this way, the Bible has a dual of authorship, Yahweh and man. Yet we recognize it is Yahweh himself who is behind the Bible's message and authority. Infallible. When we say the Bible is infallible, we mean that Yahweh's word is incapable of error because Yahweh is perfect. So is his revelation of himself. Yahweh's word will accomplish exactly what Yahweh wants it to. My word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to. So they give you lies the truth. We know the most high's word was not going to come back void. But that don't mean this is his word. We just we just get to the tip of the iceberg, family. We just went through what two, three hours in your New Testament. So, what do you mean these writers are inspired, inerrant, infallible? You're basing your salvation on the work of men. And in these last days, the Most High is talking through his people, the Israelites, who are lawful, and he's going to resurrect or save righteous strangers. That's what the text said. With that, I close, open up the floor for questions, comments, and concerns.